So we have one more uh, speaker session, a very exciting speaker session with Climate Pacific Warriors. Uh, and then that's basically the conference. We'll do a quick wrap up after that, and then it will be all home and it will be done for a year. But very importantly, let's get into this final speaker session. Um, there's no other speakers left here from the other days, are there? We're like, save the best till last. But um, <laughs> no, uh, so we have Beth and Mary from Climate Pacific Warriors who are both incredible. I'll tell you a little bit about them before they pop up on stage. Um, hands up if you've heard of Climate Pacific Warriors already. Yeah. Pacific Climate Warriors. So sorry. So sorry. <laughs> um, amazing. Cool. Most of you, which is great. And we'll hear a bit more about it. Um, so Mary is part of a global community fighting for climate justice, and she's represented Aotearoa and the Pacific at various international summits, including the United Nations Climate Summits and at One Young World. In 2018, she founded Pacific chapter of the Pacific Climate Warriors alongside her brother, um, which is this really awesome dynamic network of youth-led grassroots climate activists from across the Pacific. And they're advocating for and working with communities on the front lines of climate change. Mary won the Impact Award for Climate in 2021, which recognized her advocacy and leadership fighting for climate justice. And she currently sits on the board of New Zealand Climate Action Network and is a fossil fuel non-proliferation, that is a hard word, um, a Treaty Pacific champion. So just a huge resume of basically badass climate action going on that we are really excited to hear more about. Uh, Bethany is also going to come up and chat to us. She is the coordinator of the Pacific Climate Warriors in Te Whanganui Atara, and she is a proud New Zealand, New Zealand-born Cook Islander with connections to Aitutaki. Aitutaki. Apologies, I should have read that before. Um, Bethany is a mother, a graduate of Victoria University, and she works in the public sector. She joined the Pacific Climate Warriors to fight for climate justice for her friends and family in the Cook Islands who are experiencing the direct impacts of climate change. And she's here with her beautiful son today. Um, which is very exciting. Lovely to have you both here. So I'd love to welcome you up to the stage. And yeah, the floor is yours for the next hour or so. Nice. Um, Tana Palava, everyone. Kia ora koutou. Um, it's really good to be here. Just thank you for giving up your Sunday um, to talk about climate justice and all things climate solutions. So we're really excited to be here. Um, just a little bit about our presentation, I guess. Um, one of the key things that we want to talk to you about is just share a little bit about what Pacific climate leadership looks like and feels like and how we've experienced it in our work. Yeah. Um, so we'll be providing some examples about how we fight for climate justice. So really pulling from our personal experiences, our story, our climate stories, the journeys that we've been on to get here. Um, but we'll go into that more um, as we go. We've got a bit of a video to share with yeah. you now. So a big part of the Pacific Climate Warriors Mahi is actually um, sharing our climate stories, our climate realities. So this is just um, a music video by one of our climate warriors who's based in Tonga. So close.
So, so we thought we'd share a little bit about um, the Warriors through music and art as well, because a big part of the Climate Warriors story is that sense of hope and there's that sense of recognising that for a lot of our Pacific Islands, we know that we're really, really vulnerable, but we have to have what I've been calling lately, just like relentless hope that we can solve the climate crisis. So that's kind of the spirit and like the sentiment that we're going to move through our presentation. Um, and I guess I'm really hopeful, we're really hopeful that you can walk away um, with a little bit of a renewed hope uh, for the work that you guys will continue in the climate fight. Mm. Um, so a large part of the work that we do, um, especially as Pacific Climate Warriors, is put our stories at the forefront of the climate, um, of any climate space. Um, and so Mary and I will be sharing about our own climate stories, who we are, where we're from, um, but we'll also be sharing about our why. So what keeps us motivated? Mary mentioned about hope. Um, so what keeps us going in this fight? Um, so Kauai O. Uh, my name is Bethany Mataiti. I am a second generation New Zealand born Cook Islander. I am also a mum, as you can see. This is my son, Aitama, um, and he's pictured. Yes, there's a lot of people. Um, I am originally from Tokoroa. So anyone from the South Waikato or yeah, anyone from Tokoroa will know what the picture on the top left is. It's a picture of Kinley. Um, so Tokoroa is well known uh, as a forestry town. In the 50s, it was actually created. In, sorry, in the 50s, it was created as part of the forestry industry booming. So what you can see is a pulp and paper mill um, and is actually the reason why my grandparents from both sides of my family moved to Tokoroa, how my parents met, and, and how I was created. So 
Um, a little bit about my family, on my mom's side of the family, uh, we're Papa'a from Taranaki. Um, our villages there are Stratford and Omata. And then on my dad's side of the family, we're from Aitutaki, where my villages are Amuri and Ureya. I get my Mata'iti surname from Amuri, and my Tiokata'i family is from Ureya. You'll see a picture of Christchurch um, that was taken not long after the second earthquake that happened there. I spent a large amount of my teen years in Christchurch. Um, and during that time, I was able to witness the power of nature. Um, and that was a really significant moment in my life um, and shaped my own understanding of the land. I have been living in Wellington for the past picture of Wellington. I've been living in Wellington for the past 10, what, well, almost 10 years. I moved to Wellington to study. So I went to Victoria University. I graduated with a conjoint degree. So I have got a Bachelor of Science in Development Studies and Psychology and a Bachelor of Arts in Pacific Studies. Um, I'm a mom. So two years ago, I became a mom. This was another important event in my life. Um, but outside of that, I work for the Ministry of Social Development. I've worked for the ministry for five years, started in a call center. I'm now a service uh, manager. So I look after a team, help them develop. Um, and they then look after clients or vulnerable clients across Aotearoa. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and we'll move into my why. Um, so there's four of these six pictures are actually taken from Aitutaki. Um, you'll be able to, you can look at the pictures and see just how close the ocean is to the land. Um, and so what I want to do when I talk about my why, I think about my people. And I think when you're in your twenties or as you get older, you start, start thinking about what makes you, you. Um, and so for a very long time, I would always tie one second. I would always tie my why to the people that had made me and where I came from. And then it wasn't until I became until I became a mum that I started thinking about the future. And we'll just one moment. Um, we will change. Um, so talking about my um, past, present, and future inspirations. So Aitama, once he was born, um, that really changed the way the way that I look at the world and the contribution that I want to make and the type of world that I want to create for him. So it really had me thinking forward. And you don't have to. You don't have to have children to know that. Um, you can be an auntie, you can be an uncle, you could be a sister or a brother, um, but that's something that really shapes my own climate journey um, and helps me think of uh, a way forward and a way to be hopeful for the future. Um, there is also the inspiration that I get from my climate warrior team. Um, so you'll see Kalo and Ulu here, um, and even Mary supporting me to bring Aitama along on this journey. So my why ties back to the team that I'm part of, my friends and family, my climate warrior flat family, um, that give me strength and they give me the access to opportunities. They provide the support that I need um, to be able to bring my baby along on this journey, um, but also come to speaking events. Um, and then my longest standing why ties back to um, the man at the top of the frame. That's my papa, Puraku, um, and also my mama, who is pictured um, in the bottom left. So I'll tell you a wee story about them and why they're my longest standing why. Um, not just because they live in the Cook Islands or they're Pacific people, um, 
But in terms of my connection to the islands, um, they're what they're what centers me and my climate journey. Um, so a little bit of a story around that is that my mama passed away in 2009. It, it was quite unexpected. Um, and there's, there's been multiple conversations that I've had with my papa around where she's buried. So that's quite significant because in Cook Island culture, um, it's quite customary to bury your family with your family home, like right near your family home. Um, and so we, we assume that when my mama died, we would bury her near her family home where she'd lived most of her life. But the decision was made by my papa that we were actually going to bury her down the road at, on his family land. And I'm thinking the reason for this was because the house that my mama grew up in is 20 meters from the shoreline. And so that means that if there's a king tide, any high tide brings the water pretty much to the doorstep of the house. And so when my papa was thinking about the future, where he wanted to live the rest of his day, where he wants to live the rest of his days, he decided to move my mama 200 meters inland so that that could be her resting place. And so he could, he could live there safely. And I look at my papa as a climate expert. He's not a scientist, doesn't know the science, um, but I look at the way that he knows the land and I look at the decision that he made. And he made that decision because he was thinking about the future and he was thinking about our family and he was thinking about us coming to visit our mama and him eventually when he passes away. Um, and to be able to hold that connection is very special. So not just that, but then I look at Aitama, my newest wife. Um, and so Aitama is someone and Cook Island, but to give him that opportunity of being able to then go home to learn about where he's from, to connect to the land, that's a very special thing to me. Um, and I think that definitely guides me um, in my climate journey. So I'll hand over to me. Thanks. Um, who am I or Oaya, which is Samoan for Kwaio? Um, my full name is Mary Ngafa Maliatoa Sapatimo Onokomio. It's longer than the alphabet, but you guys can call me Mary. Um, my story is a bit all over the Pacific. So I was actually born in Wellington, but when I was four, my family moved to Australia. And so I was there until I was about 11. And then we moved back home to Samoa because my parents were making a very intentional decision to have us reconnect with our cultures. And that meant having our feet on our land. And so that's a big part of my why. Um, I'm an auntie. I've got a two-year-old nephew. And um, yeah, it's funny how when young, when babies come into your family or into your life, they completely change your perspective. And it's completely changed my perspective of why I'm in the climate space. And so we often talk about, we know that we might not necessarily live to see the fruits of our work today, but we do it in the hope that babies like Aitama, babies like my nephew Toto, young people like yourselves and your kids don't have to fight for the survival of their islands and their homes. So um, I'm also a sister, a daughter, a wife. I'm youth adjacent. I know I look pretty well, but I'm not. Um, but, you know, a big part of my background has been working in the education space and working with young people and really working with young people to realize how influential and powerful their voices are. And often, depending on the context and the community you come around, you come from, that's a little bit harder to convince certain young people of the power and influence of their voice. Um, my parents are social workers by trade. My mom was a teacher as well. So, you know, we always grew up in a household of service. Um, I didn't seek out to be in the climate space. I have a full-time job in the public sector, um, but I also, I think most of us here consider ourselves full-time volunteers and full-time climate activists. And so a big part of my story is that I feel like my climate work was thrust upon me. Um, and we'll share a little bit about how the Wellington um, Pacific Climate Warriors came to be, but essentially it was young people um, answering the call and we just, we could not, we could not have a Pacific Climate Warriors in Wellington. 
So this beautiful woman here is my grandma. She passed away in 2017. Um, and a few months, actually the month before she fell sick, we held our first climate event at Victoria. Um, and so we kind of had a little bit of pause, but um, she's a big part of like why I do this and really honoring her as an ancestor that um, I want to honor. So my other part of the, my why is um, the village that my dad is from in Opolo, Samoa. This picture here is Falafa, so it's on the east coast of Opolo Island. Um, and the village that his mom is from is now uninhabited. So where he used to grow up as a young kid 50 years ago now is completely uninhabitable because of um, the frequency and the severity of cyclones. And so that whole part of his life and his story is now a deserted village. And so um, these pictures are from um, what my family call the Maunga or the mountain, which is where my parents um, live, cultivate, look after the land, um, but it's also where they're the happiest and the healthiest. And so a big part of why I do this work as well is actually protecting this piece of land that makes my parents so happy and so healthy because when they're back in New Zealand, they're not. Um, and so uh, that's a big part of who I am, where I come from and why I'm doing this work and why I'll continue to do this work. Um, I'll share a little bit ar around what the Pacific Climate Warriors is and how we got established. So can everyone put like real strong hand up if you have um, heard of the Pacific Climate Warriors before? Nice, okay, so a good few of you. Um, the story behind the Pacific Climate Warriors is in 2015, there was a conference in Turkey. So it was, a, it was called Power Shift. And a bunch of young people from across the Pacific were brought to this conference. And what a lot of the Pacific Island young people noticed at that conference is the narrative that was peddled around um, climate change and Pacific Islands was that we were needing help, that we were needing handouts, that we were really vulnerable. Um, and while to an extent we are vulnerable to the impacts of climate justice, it actually completely dismissed and ignored the fact that for a lot of our Pacific leaders, for three decades, we had been actually warning the world um, aligned with what scientists have been saying around what was going to happen with climate change. And so that was kind of the catalyst, um, that conference in 2014. And since then, our Pacific Climate Warrior Network has grown. Um, we're really lucky that we've got about, we call it four cohorts of young people um, engaged young adults that have come through our trainings and our workshops to really center, first of all, why are they doing this and who, who are they in this climate fight before you can go on, you know, do all the public actions. So a little bit about our spread. We actually operate across 18 Pacific Island nations and diaspora communities. So we're in about 15 islands and then we have teams in, um, the US, Australia, and New Zealand. So that's just to give you a bit of context about who we are and then how we came about. Um, so just to speak to the Pacific leadership, so Mary's already kind of talked about how there was a point in time that triggered a lot of action um, from Pacific youth. So uh, the picture on the left is a picture of Selena Lim. She's a Marshallese climate activist and she's sitting alongside um, the Marshallese foreign minister at that point in time. Um, but I just want to highlight this because as part of the 1.5 to stay alive campaign, um, we saw uh, Pacific youth speaking up at a global level, right? Um, so what Selena was sharing uh, in this photo is she was sharing about how so global, basically global leaders had set some targets around lowering their, their emissions, so their contributions to the climate crisis. And they were saying, okay, cool, we'll set our targets for two degrees. Um, and what Selena um, spoke to was that actually we needed to be more ambitious with our goals. 
Um, and so she sat at that global conference and she put forth the challenge um, for global leaders to actually do better. Um, so that's a really powerful picture because it represents um, the power of Pacific youth to influence policy at a global level. Um, you can then see that middle picture is a picture of Tokelau. Um, at the top end of the screen, you'll be able to see some solar panels. Um, so Tokelau is actually the first country to go fully solar powered. Um, and so when you think about this, uh, when you think about the Pacific leadership when it comes to the climate crisis, the Pacific contribute the least to the climate crisis. But if you look at the actions that we're taking, they're bold, they're ambitious, and they also set the challenge for other countries to follow. So I'll hand over to Mary to talk about the um, Court of Justice Advisory. So just in addition, addition to that, the context for the solar powers is that they were um, New Zealand aid funded, but the point of what we're sharing here is if all of the Pacific Island nations or the small island nations were to stop emitting carbon, we would barely make a dent in global emissions. So Tokelau doesn't actually need to go solar powered, but what we're trying to show is how we've continued to lead by example. Um, in 2021, Vanuatu announced its intention to ask for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on climate change and human rights. And so this year, I believe it was passed at the United Nations General Assembly, which basically means that we are going to the International Court of Justice to seek an advisory opinion on whether climate change infringes the human rights of peoples. Um, and so that's really important for us because it speaks to the ambitious, the ambitions of Pacific leaders um, and a lot of our allies who have been able to stand by us and push a lot of these actions, um, which is why we want to show that element of our work as well. Um, more recently, in, um, we're launching a bit of a campaign here in New Zealand to actually get New Zealand to endorse the call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. So for those of you who know, which I assume is most people, the biggest contribu contributor to the climate um, crisis is fossil fuels. And so despite that fact and that reality, we continue to proliferate or produce fuels and we continue to burn fuels. So the Pacific has actually put um, forward uh, a call to actually ask other bigger governments to endorse the creation of a treaty that would um, force people or force governments, it's an international agreement, to commit to three pillars for that for this treaty. So firstly, it's to stop the production of fossil fuels completely. We do not need to extract any more fossil fuels. We can actually meet the need for energy right now with the existing fossil fuels that we have above ground and the re renewable, renewable energy sources that we have at the moment. The second pillar is to start phasing out the, fuel, the fossil fuels that we do have above ground. So keep it in the ground and what we do have above, we want to start phasing that out. And then the final one and the most important one is actually working with um, the global community to understand what does a just transition from fossil fuel reliance to a greener renewable uh, energy source look like in different contexts. So this is acute awareness that actually the way that uh, Aotearoa would transition may not necessarily be the same way that South Africa would, would transition. So those are the three key pillars. Um, Vanuatu was the first country in the world to actually call for this treaty. And in a year, five more Pacific countries have called for this treaty. There is no other country outside of the Pacific that has called for the endorsement of a fossil, that has endorsed and called for the fossil fuel treaty. And no city in New Zealand yet has endorsed the call for a fossil fuel treaty. So those of you who are maybe in your local youth councils, you know, this is something that you can actually start thinking about if you want to um, explore ways to be in solidarity with Pacific leadership. Um, and just a comment to um, just move forward from that is that if we look at the support from other Pacific countries for this treaty, um, we, we need to be putting pressure on New Zealand. So uh, if we look at 
these specific countries that have come and stood in solidarity with um, Vanuatu. And so where is New Zealand in that conversation? Where is Australia in that conversation? Um, so it's about us putting pressure on. Um, we're in a good place in Wellington, a good space to be able to um, talk to our decision makers. Um, so we can really capitalize on the actions that we're taking. Yeah, one thing I would add as well is just understanding the context of what New Zealand of New Zealand's power and influence in the Pacific region. The Pacific Islands is the only area, are the only islands or region where New Zealand has colonized, therefore reap the fruits of that colonization. So one, New Zealand is part of the Pacific region. It wields influence and power over the Pacific. So therefore also has a, um, a moral duty and an obligation to actually stand in solidarity with a lot of the Pacific islands. Also noting that multiple Pacific, uh, sorry, multiple um, New Zealand governments have spoken at length about their commitment to endorsing Pacific leadership and standing in solidarity. So just another brief fact. Um, so just speaking to um, some of the work that the Te Whanganui Atara team do. So our team actually came into place um, in 2017. Mary mentioned um, earlier that um, Atala Noa basically happened where we invited climate activists or activists in general to come together. Um, and then fast forward a year to 2018, we held another workshop. Um, this is quite special because Mary actually helped start this, right, in 2017. So a year later, um, that size doubled. So what we noticed was a call to action that happened in 2017 and then a response from our Pacific community. Um, we have we have to thank um, Victoria University, the Pacific student body in particular, for helping build the solidarity in this movement. Um, and then 2000, bring on 2019, um, what we saw again was more Pacific leadership. So our uh, Te Whanganui Atara team, so you would have heard about it in the news. Um, there were some climate strikes that happened in 2019 across the country. It was about 110,000 people um, took part. In Wellington, though, it was about 40,000. So just to give you an idea of how many people that is, um, Sky Stadium holds about 34,000 people, and we had 40,000 people marching all the way from Civic Square to Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, what was special about this, though, was that it was youth. So we, um, so the climate strike was led by School Strike for Climate alongside the Pacific Climate Warriors. Um, I actually joined the Climate Warriors in 2019, and it was a very special experience to be standing at the front of that strike and see Pacific culture at the forefront of that conversation um, and to see you coming and, and showing up to that conversation and putting the pressure on decision makers. Um, so a very special moment. Um, and so you'll be able to see two examples of some of the work that we do. Um, there's, our work goes far beyond these two examples, but we've pulled these two uh, because they speak to um, the way that we're engaging with our community. Um, so you can see on the left, there's an example of, um, so this is um, one bit of work that we did. It was actually, we ran a campaign during COVID um, and what we aimed to do from this was to engage with Pacific communities and understand that Pacific people had power in their vote um, when it came to choosing who was going to be in power. Um, so uh, we ran a campaign. We did this during COVID. So it started off as a paper survey. Um, we aimed to engage with the community and we actually shifted it online um, as lockdown restrictions came into place. Um, but it was really about building on the strengths of our of our community and figuring out what was important to our community before we brought in all the science or anything like that. What's important to our people in their everyday lives? And then how can we go from that and connect it into the climate crisis? Um, and then um, I guess another example was something more, much more recent. So last month, our team went out to Nainai College um, and you can see um, one of the pictures is actually our uh, warrior Gab speaking. Um, this was really special because Gab's actually attended Nainai College 
And from some of the reflections that I've heard, um, it was the points where she got up and she shared her climate story that were really, really powerful. Um, because these kids that are at high school, they're able to see that, hey, maybe they've got their own climate story. And so they were really able to engage with that. Um, so what we've seen over the development of the Te Whanganui Atara team is um, we're just bringing more and more people in. And so we're really building solidarity, but we're also seeing a response from Pacific youth and our call to action. Yeah. Um, I think a big component as well of like how we move through our spaces is recognizing that sometimes the big um, public things that you see isn't actually all of what our activism is. It's actually working with young people, with our communities, having hard conversations. To be honest, like a lot of our mamas and papas, they're not thinking climate change or they're not ready to have to engage in that level of conversations. And same as for a lot of our young people. So um, for us, this is really saying that there's two, there's, it's more than just what you see on social media. It's more than just what you see on TV, that actually the work that you do investing in people in your own local communities is where there's most power. Um, we thought we'd also share what climate just a uh, climate justice, um, definition. So this is from the United Nations and it says climate justice insists on a shift from a discourse on greenhouse gases and melting ice caps into a civil rights movement with people and communities most vulnerable to climate impacts at its heart. Um, and I think more recently with the New Zealand context, you know, we've spoken a lot about the reality of um, the climate impacts and the climate harms that our Pacific Island families are feeling right now, but that's a reality now New Zealand is really starting to feel with the cyclones and the floods. And so, again, we can talk about um, policy and cold hard data and science, but actually what's at the core of this movement is people, is who's, who's at the front lines, who's being impacted, who's around the decision-making table, which is a big part of our mahi. Um, so I guess when we talk about like what climate justice is in practice, um, these, this is not all of it, but for us, a big part of it is it's intersectional. A lot of um, the injustices that we face right now are exacerbated through climate change. And so really understanding how um, it multiplies other forms of, of inequity and really having um, an intentional lens around that intersectionality. Um, contextual, so really recognizing um, when we're addressing climate change issues that we're, we're aware of how people can and should contribute to solutions. So um, an example of this is my brother was at a climate camp in Belgium and it was vegan and he is a big stocky rugby island boy. And so he stuck it out for a good few um, days. And so on the fourth, fifth day, he was... Um, feeling a bit hungry and so him and the group that he was with a few of them um, walked like two hours or so to find a feed to sustain themselves and when they came back he was actually called out by a lot of the other climate activists that were there and what my brother had to point out is actually the practice of eating meat isn't the issue it's the industrialization and the overconsumption of meat that is the issue and for a lot of indigenous communities we have farmed and fished sustainably for centuries and continue to. So again, being intersectional, being contextual, understanding that the way that you come to the climate justice movement, the way that you come to the climate change space, isn't necessarily going to be the same way that someone else is going to be able to come to, and that's okay. Um, Decolonial. So you can kind of tell by um, our presentation today that a big part of um, our story is sharing our climate story. And key to that is really recognizing that the systems and the structures that have enabled the climate crisis cannot be the ones that will drive climate solutions. Hence why you need to have diversity of voice, whether you know that's frontline indigenous communities or even within your local community, who's represented, who isn't represented. 
And then a big one for us is ambitious. So um, a lot of people have said to us, you know, you're, we're going to surpass 1.5 anyway. Why are you guys still harping on about 1.5? 1.5 for us represents the level of ambition that we need um, New Zealand, the Pacific and the whole world to move at because of what we have to lose if we surpass that sooner than we need to. So for example, a real, a, a real um, example of that is, you know, in 10 years or so, the reality is we might lose Tokelau. And so, um, that's a really hard pill for us to swallow. It's some, um, it's, it's a pill we're probably not going to swallow until it happens because we can't move through the climate crisis accepting that fate because we know what our whenua, we know what our land, our seas mean to us, not just in terms of um, our cultures, but also just in terms of our identity and who we are and how we move through the world. I mean, it touches every aspect of our health. Um, so that's a um few tips on what we look to when we think about climate justice and what we um would really encourage you to reflect on yeah. um and so just before we um hand it over to you all for some questions um i just want to have a couple of reflections around what climate justice means to me we've got some buzzwords we've got you know um what it should look like in an ideal world but um as mary was speaking i was actually thinking about um what climate justice looks like to me and a couple of months ago we were invited um for a consultation at the climate commission and what was really special about that, it was it was after work, so late night after work. Um, but what was special about that was sitting around the table with uh, the climate commissioners, with the Te Whanganui Atara team, but also Aitama was there, um, and Eddie, uh, climate warrior Eddie and her daughter Mel Melody. Um, and they were sitting at that decision-making decision table um, with us. And so for me, climate justice is about ensuring that we've got safe spaces for our people of all ages to be sitting there and be heard. I think often um, we fall into a trap of thinking that we have to be climate scientists to make a difference. For me, climate justice is about acknowledging that our people have an inherent knowledge of the land um, and understanding that um, when it comes to the climate fight, our knowledge of the land, our relationship to the land, our love and our care um, is life-changing. Um, so just a couple of um, thoughts around that. And when um, we had that point about being ambitious, so um, it's not necessarily or it's not, not directly um, connected to the climate fight, but I think back to COVID um, and the ambition of uh, people in Aitutaki. So um, the goal was to get everybody vaccinated and Aitutaki has a population of about 1,400 people. Um, and the whole the whole island was vaccinated and I think it was three days. I think it was four days max. Um, but if you think about the ambition of Pacific people, um, that's something really powerful. And there's so many examples of it. Um, it's not something that we necessarily have to pull out and prove to people. Um, it can be something that just um, sits in our heart. Okay. So we just wanted to give a chance for you to ask any questions or offer any thoughts. Um, same thing as you guys can put the hands up with some nice things. Probably a time for about three, maybe four questions. So get your hand up. There we go. Nice. Um, you spoke about the fossil fuels and non-proliferation treaty. Do you have any advice on a place that would have some really good information about that? Or like if we want to talk to other people somewhere, we can point them to yes. that's like, this is what we want. I yes, thought. we can. So if you go on to www.fossilfuel.com, 
treaty.com or if you just Google fossil fuel treaty, there is a website there. Um, we're currently in the planning stages of what um, a New Zealand campaign will look like. So we've already done some groundwork. So we're hoping that, is anyone here from Kapiti by any chance? Nice, nice, nice. So we have been working with Sophie Hanford to get a motion through. Um, hopefully the council will endorse um, and we're hoping that we can actually spread that work across um, the motu. So that would be one, go on the website. Um, what I would really say is, you know, look at who your local leaders are. Um, if you want, get in touch with us. Um, you can go on our Pacific Climate Warriors um, page, or even if you just write down Pacific Climate Warriors um, dot at gmail.com, feel free to um, flick us an email. There'll be things coming up in that space. But yeah, definitely look at how you can um, lobby your local leaders. If you're part of an organization, it could be your school, it could be your church, it could be, um, you know, any youth organization that you're part of, feel free if you, if you, if that's something that you want to put in front of them to endorse as an organization, the more small groups continue, the bigger, um, the swell or the ground swell will be. So there's lots of little things that you can do, but, um, for sure we'll be launching our New Zealand Mahi soon. Okay. Um, Christian, do you think that like the things you've done have like impacted your like the way you live? So like when you were like first starting out in this area, do you think the things that you did like recently have impacted your life? Sorry, can you ask that one more time? So the things that the thing the changes you have done to like the countries and stuff, do you think that they have impacted the way you like work around life and stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very hard to be a part of. Um, for us, the climate space and in the climate work and talk about the leadership of our Pacific nations and not change how we live. Um, you know, like I always go back to food for a variety of reasons, but, you know, if you know Pacific Island cultures, like a big part of how we come into community is around food and so or even how we consume. And so um, for a lot of us in our team, we're very, very mindful of that as well. And so um, it has really shifted in how we, um, view our lives and how we are mindful of the actions that we take. Um, so yeah, it, it really has. Is that sort of the answer you're looking for? I think just to add on to that as well. Um, so yes, I'm a Cook Islander, but I'm also a Pākehā. And so as part of that, um, and as part of the work that we do as climate warriors, it's also acknowledging my privilege and my access to resources. So often um, for me, if I acknowledge my Pākehā um, ancestry, it's about me learning to put Pacific voices even <laughs> Um, even though I am Pacific, it's about making sure that Pacific voices are prioritized in all climate conversations. If that means me being quiet and pushing someone else forward, then that's important to me. Um, so really looking at yeah, looking at your your self and what you bring to the table before you you look at the impact that you make on anyone else. Um, Picking up on your ambitious point there, um, do you think that um, Aotearoa should be um, declaring that they will take all um, climate refugees from the Pacific as an as an ambition, as a goal that we should go to, go uh, strive towards? Keeping bearing in mind that none of our people want to leave their home, yeah, but that should it happen that we've already declared that we're going to take our, our cousins from the Pacific. And are you guys doing workshops in schools? We are doing workshops in schools. The climate migration one is an interesting one. Um, so, like, yes, my personal view is that if we got to that point where we are needing to um, make space and create space for, our, for climate refugees 100%, I guess, again, that's where that ambitious part comes in is actually really highlighting that we don't, our people also don't want to come here. You know, they want to remain on island. They want to be able to experience their land and all of that. And so um, there's that element. The other part of it as well is recognizing um, that our current systems and uh, 
con social context isn't very well placed and looking after the most vulnerable in our communities in Aotearoa already. So really understanding that when we're talking about climate solutions, the impact that New Zealand has in terms of reducing their domestic um, footprint or carbon emissions, for example, has an impact on the the lifestyles of our communities and the islands. I, if we're not modeling the ambition that we need here in Aotearoa, the reality of that is that there will be an influx of refugees and we're not really guaranteed to look after them well because we don't look after our people in Aotearoa already very well. So it's a complex conversation. I would advocate to say, to have that commitment that we will look after our people. Um, one, if you just understand the history and the political history of New Zealand in the Pacific. But then on the other hand, it's really actually saying we need New Zealand to step up and stand in solidarity with Pacific leaders, i.e. when we're in international forums, you need to be actively um, supporting what Pacific leaders are pushing in those international forums because there are cases where a lot of um, the Pacific delegates or negotiators in those international climate spaces do actively um, put up walls um, and challenges to what the Pacific is pushing. Awesome, thank you for having us.